Have you ever heard of soul sleep? Have you ever wondered what that phrase really means? It is a controversial doctrine taught by three major groups, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Christadelphians. It's based on various scriptures that use that terminology, like what Jesus said at the grave of Lazarus. In fact, on his way to the grave, he said, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go to wake him up. That's John 11, 11. So when Lazarus died, did his soul go into an unconscious, non-functional sleep mode in the grave with his body? And is that the plight of everyone who dies, that we merely sleep in the grave? Or is it true that born-again believers can trust in the concept that Paul shared that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? So we've got a lot of good territory to cover, and it is a vitally important doctrine to explore. Soul sleep is also called conditional immortality. And even though I mentioned three groups promote this concept, we're only going to focus on the beliefs and teachings of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, let me start by saying I have some very close friends, some very dear friends, who belong to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And I believe they are extremely genuine and passionate born-again believers. However, they're very strong in accepting and promoting the doctrine of soul sleep. And so I share this not to be argumentative toward them, but in a Berean fashion, exploring the truth. I'd be very happy to hear their point of view if this was a discussion podcast, if I was interviewing them. And maybe that can happen in the future. I hope it does. Now, let me quote from a Seventh-day Adventist, or SDA for short, website. God's word states that after Adam was created, he became a living soul when his body, which God made out of dust, received breath from God. That's Genesis 2-7. Before this life-giving breath came from God, there was no Adam. He became an individual soul. When body and breath came together, he became an individual, a soul. When body and breath came together, the soul is the full integration that makes up the individual person. Now listen to the next part. This is still part of a quote from the Seventh-day Adventist website. It is specific to each person. In other words, the soul is individually unique in each person. It never leaves his or her body, and it dies when the person dies. It dies? The soul dies. It goes into a sleep mode, into a non-functional state. Would Jesus agree with that? I'm drawn to his statement in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, where he very bluntly and courageously said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. If it was true that when the body dies, the soul dies simultaneously, that would have been a ludicrous statement for Jesus to make, because if someone killed the body, automatically they would be killing the soul. Before proceeding any further, we need a biblically sound concept or teaching concerning the spiritual makeup of human beings, what we're comprised of. I believe we are triune beings. We are spirit, soul, and body. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the word translated soul is nefesh. The word translated spirit is ruach. In the New Testament, the Greek word suke is translated soul, and the word pneuma is translated spirit. And if you follow that through and do a really deep word study, you'll discover some very interesting things. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, pulls it all together. Paul said in a prayerful statement over the Thessalonian church, 
May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. The King James says holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body, your pneuma, suke, and soma, your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So human beings are a trinity of trinities. There's three parts to you. And each one of those parts has three primary parts. The body is made up of flesh, bones, and blood. The soul is made up of mind, will, and emotions. And the spirit has three functions, communion with God, revelation from God, and conscience. Now, in a fallen individual, the spirit, for all intents and purposes, is dead in trespasses and sins. No communion with God, no revelation from God, and conscience is barely functional. It's like a barely burning ember where there used to be a raging fire. The soul is the dominant controlling force in an ordinary human being who has not been born again. However, when you're born again and the Holy Spirit comes into you and your spirit and God's spirit are fused together, it reactivates the spirit. That's why the Bible really means you're born from above. See, when Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, the Greek word is anothen, A-N-O-T-H-E-N, which literally means from above. You must be born from above. In fact, it's translated that way in other places in scripture. So God puts a brand new spirit in you that is fully functional and your journey spiritually from that point forward is for your spirit to have the dominant controlling uh, influence in your life and your soul to conform to the divine nature that is resident in your spirit. Hebrews 4.12 is an important passage. It says, The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. The King James says the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. In other words, reading God's word, studying God's word, doing deep word studies in the word of God will enable you to differentiate between the functions of the spirit and the functions of the soul. The word of God is like a sharp sword that cuts in between the two and shows you what is soulish or sensual and bound to the lower nature that needs to be dealt with. Now let's go into some scriptural passages that seem to support the idea of soul sleep and those that refute the concept of soul sleep. And we'll do a comparison between the two. One of the primary passages that Seventh-day Adventists use to support this concept is Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Let me just read it exactly word for word. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Another translation, the BBE translation, Bible in Basic English, puts it this way. The living are conscious that death will come to them, but the dead are not conscious of anything, and they no longer have a reward because there is no memory of them. So does that support the idea of soul sleep? Think about it. I believe that Solomon, if you read Ecclesiastes from the very beginning, was not stating absolute inspired truth. He was musing about possibilities. He was pondering what might be the answer to life. He was not declaring certainties. The beginning verse, verse 1 of that very chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Solomon says, I considered all this in my heart. He did not say, thus saith the Lord. 
he did not say, I am declaring truth from God. He's saying, I'm dealing with this stuff in my heart. I'm wondering about this. I'm pondering whether or not it's true. I believe this too. Walton Mart Martin, Walter Martin said this in one of his books, it is almost universally agreed among biblical scholars that Ecclesiastes portrays Solomon's apostasy or when he fell away into a very lustful life and is therefore questionable for determining doctrine. Well, I believe it wasn't just Solomon's time of apostasy. It may have involved that but I believe it was Solomon's time of questioning what was really important in life and what was true about human existence. And so when you read it, you need to read it from that stance, from that viewpoint. Also, I think it's important to see that there was very limited understanding about the afterlife in Solomon's day at that stage of development in what God had said to his people up to that point. Solomon also could have very well, and I believe he was speaking of the physical body, not the spiritual condition of man. When he said, and let's go back to it, he said, the dead know nothing, or the BBE translation, the dead are not conscious of anything. He wasn't talking about the spiritual state of a human being that dies. He was talking about the physical body that contains that gray matter, that brain that suddenly becomes non-functional. Yes, it is non-functional. The thinking mechanism and the ability to communicate are gone. At death, cold, lifeless, and non-functional, the physical aspect. If taken literally, that verse does not agree with other scriptures. For instance, it says, their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. In other words, they will never experience love again. How can that be? Because in a heavenly state, even at the resurrection, if it's true, according to Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, that we are asleep in the grave until the day of resurrection, and then we're made immortal, then we couldn't love then. We couldn't love God and love each other. Because in this passage, Solomon said their love perishes, and nevermore will they have a share in anything that is done under the sun. Well, if that be true, then how could we function in the millennial age, the messianic period where Jesus will reign on this planet? That will be under the sun, and we're supposed to rule and reign with him as kings and priests. Also, that scripture says they have no more reward. How could he be talking about the covenant people of God? Because God is very much involved in rewarding his people. In fact, in Hebrews, it says those who come to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And in the last chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 12, the eternal Messiah, the resurrected Christ said, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. So if Ecclesiastes 9 verses 5 and 6 is absolute truth, those two passages fully contradict each other. One has to be right and the other has to be wrong or one has to be revealed truth and the other has to be a human being trying to figure out what life is all about. There's a similar passage in Psalm 115, verse 17 and 18. That passage, verse 17, says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. Whoa, that makes it sound like there's no worship of God going on from the state of existence beyond death? Is that right? Is that true? The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. But the very next verse contradicts that interpretation of that verse, because the next verse says, but we, speaking of God's covenant people, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Praise Yahweh. 
So I believe once again, the psalmist was talking about the physical aspect of what happens in death, that when that corpse goes into a tomb or a grave, it's not going to praise. It's not going to worship. It's not going to shout in the presence of God. You better get your shouting and your worshiping done now. But if you belong to God in the spiritual state, you will be worshiping him. From this time forth, the psalmist said, from what time? The time of dying. From this time forth and forevermore. Think of that. Next, interpreting the nature of the spirit is very important to compare Seventh-day Adventist doctrine to uh, what you might call conservative evangelical doctrine. In the same book, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, listen to what Solomon wrote. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken, which is metaphorical for death taking place. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Well, a person who believes in soul sleep will say, well, that's differentiating between the spirit and the soul. And the spirit will go back to God, but the soul remains in the grave. And they explain that the spirit, which is translated from the Hebrew word ruach, the spirit is simply the life force, the life force, that it's not a personal being, a character, that is the nefesh, the soul. But SDA teaching is that the ruach is just the life force. Animals have life force that goes back after that animal dies. And so it is with human beings. But I would question that with this comparison. The Holy Spirit in Hebrew is the ruach hakodesh. So if Ruach means like an impersonal force, a life force. Why would the Holy Spirit be termed with that word? Because the Holy Spirit is a person, not just a force. That's streamed from Eastern religions. The force is something I'm sure you're familiar with uh, from the movie Star Wars. It reduces God to just an impersonal energy. But the Ruach is much more than that. It is the personal presence of God, the character of God expressed toward us and in us. Now, this is from an SDA website. The biblical meaning of spirit is the heading. Whereas the Hebrew word nefesh, translated soul, denotes individuality and personality, the Old Testament Hebrew word Ruach, translated spirit, refers to the energizing spark of life essential to individual existence. It stands for the divine energy or the life principle that animates human beings. Hmm. Is it just a life principle? And is the soul the individual personality? Let's go up to the New Testament, to Acts chapter 7, verse 59. Stephen is being martyred for his faith, the first martyr of the church. And he preached a phenomenal sermon to a crowd of very angry Jews that he would dare to declare that Yeshua was the Messiah. And they stoned Stephen, verse 59, as he was calling on God, he said, Lord Jesus, Yahweh, Yeshua, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And the Greek word is pneuma, which is the same as the Hebrew word ruach. That would not make any sense at all if it was just a principle of life within Stephen and the soul was really his personality. If he said, receive my spirit, then he would be saying, receive this life essence from me, but my soul's going to stay in the grave. The next verse, verse 60 
says he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. And what a Christ-like thing to do. It makes me weep sometimes when I'm alone reading this. He said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. So see, even the New Testament uses this kind of terminology, and we'll go into other passages in just a moment to verify that. But really, what does that mean? What does it mean he fell asleep? We'll touch on that in just a moment. But see, I believe when God breathed into Adam, he became a living soul. That's when the spirit and the soul were fused together into one and integrated with the body, and he became a living soul. Now, human beings that are not right with God are dead souls, and they have a non-functional spirit. But still, that doesn't reduce the spirit to a mere life essence or life force. Because, see, the breath is this essential element that we need to explore. When God breathed into Adam, what did he breathe? Just oxygen and nitrogen? Does God breathe the gaseous vapors of this atmosphere? Is he confined to that? So that when he breathed into Adam, that was the limit of what took place and that his lungs began to heave as he breathed the atmosphere around him? Or did God mingle not only the natural breath that came from the gaseous vapors in the atmosphere of the earth, but divine breath? Because I believe there's a difference between the two. When Jesus was in the upper room after having resurrected from the dead, he breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, they already had natural breath that made them functional human beings on a certain plane, on a certain level. But when he breathed on them, divine breath and natural breath were fused together as one. Very important to see that. Now, the metaphor of sleep, and I do believe it's metaphorical. It's not literal. Just like it said, Stephen went to sleep. He fell asleep. The whole concept of going to sleep when you die is a way of, of reducing the fearfulness of death to something more acceptable. Because even we do it with other phrases. We don't say so-and-so died because that just sounds too harsh. We say so-and-so passed away. And that somehow makes it smoother and softer, more palatable, more acceptable. And I believe all through the centuries and millennia prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when people died, it was easier, instead of saying that cold statement, that person's dead, to say that person went to sleep. And you find that 36 times in the Old Testament, you find the phrase, especially with kings, leaders, that when that person died, he slept with his fathers. One specific example, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 10, David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. The Bible in basic English, BBE translation says, then David went to rest with his fathers and his body was put into the earth in the town of David. So that kind of, the BBE translation differentiates between him resting with his fathers in an afterlife area that was filled with the peace of God, a chamber that is called Abraham's bosom, but his body was put in the earth in the town of David. Of course, the New King James Version and the King James Version don't really convey that idea. It just says David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. All right, what about Daniel? He used this metaphor in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. He talked about the end of days and the final conclusive thing called the resurrection of the dead. And he said, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Even Jesus used this metaphor concerning Jairus's daughter when Jairus wanted Jesus to come and pray for his daughter. 
uh, then at a certain point, they said, no, don't bother the master. She's already dead. But Jesus said, do not weep. She's not dead, but sleeping. Luke chapter 8, verses 52 through uh, 55. And they ridiculed him. And they mocked him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside. And he took her by the hand and said, little girl, arise. And then Luke chapter 8, verse 55, a very important verse says, then her spirit, which is the Greek word pneuma, which relates to the Hebrew word ruach, then her spirit returned and she arose immediately. So her spirit, I believe, was her personality and it was fused with her soul. And, and of course, when her spirit returned, her soul returned. Of course, uh, someone who would promote the idea of soul sleep would say, no, the soul was with the body, but the spirit came back again. So I understand that they would use that uh, belief to explain that passage of scripture. Then one we've already touched on, John 11, verses 11 through 14, Jesus told his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go to wake him up. His disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'd, he'll be well, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But then when he came to the graveside of Lazarus, and I wish I had time to tell you the whole story, it's so powerful. At a certain point in his conversation with Martha, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And here's the key verse. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So he is saying that whoever believes in him, when they die physically, they never die soulishly or spiritually. And of course, the doctrine of soul sleep says the soul and the body both die simultaneously. But Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The soul continues on living in a supernatural state. Paul used this metaphor, and this is going to be so, so powerful. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through verse 18, Paul said, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Again, the metaphorical way of dealing with death to smooth over the horror of it. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who do not have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, listen now, listen now, even so, God will bring with him, those who sleep in Jesus. God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Well, if those souls are sleeping in the grave, they're not with him. But if they're in a heavenly world with the Lord Jesus Christ, then their souls infused with their spirits will return with him when he comes again to retrieve their bodies at the resurrection. It's a much different way of looking at things. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The Bible does not teach soul sleep. The Bible teaches that believers will receive new, transformed, eternal bodies, immortal bodies, at the time of the final resurrection of the dead, just before the creation of the new heaven and the new earth at the end of the messianic era. All right, Bible passages that challenge the concept of soul sleep, and I'm going to go through some very quickly because there's quite a few Bible passages that contradict the idea of soul sleep. Genesis 35, 17 and 18, Rachel's death. 
It came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have a son also. You will have this son. And so it was as her soul was departing, nefesh, as her soul was departing for she died, that she called his name Benona, which means son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. But right there it says, her soul was departing. Hmm. What about the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ? Matthew 17, verses 1 through 8. I don't have time to quote it all to you, but you should read it. Matthew 17, 1 through 8. Moses and Elijah appeared on the mountain when Jesus was transfigured and his raiment was bright, shining, radiant like the sun, and he conversed with Moses. But wait a second. We know Elijah was translated, so he never saw death, but Moses did die, and God himself even buried Moses. So his soul should have been in the grave with his body, but instead he had an appearance. He was recognizable as Moses, so it was very similar to what his physical appearance was, and he conversed with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's proof that there's life outside of the body, existence outside of the body at death. What about the whole story Jesus gave of the rich man and Lazarus? In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, once again, I urge you to read the whole passage, but a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Strangely, it never said he was immoral or deceitful or a liar or a thief. The main thing that he did wrong was he ate sumptuous meals every day and never cared about the poor. And there was a beggar at his gate named Lazarus. Lazarus died and was carried into Abraham's bosom. But the rich man died and ended up also down in Hades in the lower worlds, but he was in a different chamber, the chamber of the wicked, and there was an impassable gulf between the realm of the wicked and the realm of the righteous, which was called Abraham's bosom. And there was conversation between the rich man and Abraham, and there was, there was uh, evidence that they had a conscious existence after death. What about the thief on the cross? Luke chapter 23, verses 42 and 43. When they're dying next to the Lord Jesus Christ, one thief curses at him, and the other thief says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, assuredly, or verily, verily, I say to you in the King James, verily, verily, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, people who believe in soul sleep say the comma is placed in the wrong place, that it should say, assuredly, I say unto you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. And that pushes it way out in the future toward the resurrection. But there is absolutely no other passage of scripture in the entire New Testament where that phrase, verily, verily, I say unto you, or verily, verily, I speak to you, or assuredly, I say to you, is connected to the word today and then a comma, because it's, it's to be taken for granted. If I say, I am really telling you something important right now. I don't have to say today because you know it's right here, right now, today that I am saying it. But if I said, I'm going to tell you something very important today, I am going to cut the yard. I'm going to mow the yard. The grass is way too high. Then it makes sense. It applies to the action of that day. Jesus was talking about where he would take the thief on the cross. Also, one of Jesus' last statements on the cross would make absolutely no sense if the spirit was just a, an energy, a life essence, a life force, because one of his seven last statements was, crying out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He was talking about his personality, who he was coming right into the Father's presence. 
And 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19 confirms that. It says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So if he, in a supernatural state, went and preached in the underworld, that totally negates the idea of soul sleep. Otherwise, Jesus' soul would have been in the grave with his body, and a life essence would not have gone into Hades, or Sheol, as the Jews called it, to preach, because a life essence can't do that, but a person can 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 10 is another passage you should read in entirety. We've already mentioned it in verses 6, 7, and 8. Paul said, we are confident, and I am confident in this revelation, in this interpretation of what happens at death for those who are born again. We are confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body. Well pleased to be sleeping with the body in the grave? No. To be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Praise God. In fact, he said, therefore, we make it our aim that whether present or absent, we are well pleasing to him. I've got just a couple of final things to say. Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, Paul once again verifies this. He says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He's talking about a personal, loving connection and communion with the resurrected Savior. But he said, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. I believe when Paul was beheaded, he went straight to heaven, to paradise. I believe when Stephen was martyred, he went straight to heaven, to paradise, to be with the Lord Jesus. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, how long, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The souls of those who were slain for the word of God were not sleeping in the grave. They were depicted metaphorically and poetically Yes, it is a symbolic picture, but they were depicted as being under the altar in a protected place. But that represented the heavenly sphere that they were dwelling in. Also, finally, the last scripture I'll quote, Mark 13, 27, talks about the end of the age and the coming of the Lord. And it said, then Jesus will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds. Listen now from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. In other words, some of his elect will be alive in the earth when he comes again. Some will be in a soulish state in heaven, but he will gather them all together to this great day of the coming of the Lord. The last thing I'd like to say, and you can't base doctrine on this, but experience does mean something. I have a very dear friend who has passed on to heaven. His name was Rick Madison. He was in a head-on collision when he was just a young man. He was coming back from an all-night drinking party and slammed into another vehicle. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. And somehow they revived him, but he was in a comatose state for something like 40 days. I don't remember the exact amount. 42, 43 days. And then he died again. And when he died the second time, his soul went into the chapel in the hospital where his mother was praying for him. He tried to reach out and touch her and his hand went right through her body. So he knew he was in a soulless state. 
and desperate, he looked up, and I don't know the exact words he said, but something to the effect, God, help me. If you can save me now, save me. Jesus, help me. And bam, he snapped back into his body and came back alive. The, the nurse in the room, the hospital room, had already pronounced him dead. So it startled her. And that's a soft word for the the frightening kind of feeling she felt, I'm sure, when he came back to life and the, and the uh, sheet started rustling. He had a trachea tube, so he couldn't talk. He motioned to her to give him a pad of paper, and he wrote, please go tell my mother that God's worked a miracle, that I'm alive. And she said, well, where is your mother? And he wrote, she's, uh, he's, he wrote something like, do you have a, a church or a chapel in this hospital? And she said, yes. And then he described the color carpet, the, the look of the pews. She said, yes, that's the chapel in our hospital. He said, well, my mother's there. Please go tell her that God's moved for me. She said, how do you know your mother's there? He said, I just came from there. It is the most powerful refuting of the idea of soul sleep that I've ever known of because his soul left his body and went to the chapel and he was able to describe it and he was able to tell the nurse that his mother was there. And he lived on for many years. In fact, God raised him up from a wheelchair. And he preached all over the world. He had a marvelous miracle ministry. Yes, I believe we should review all of these scriptures. And I urge my friends who are Seventh-day Adventists, who really love the Lord, who have a genuine relationship with Jesus, they're wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ, please take to heart what I've said. And don't take it as a personal slam, but take it as an appeal that we should re-inspect these doctrines.